and the Curie's story caught the imagination of the press. In 1903, they won the Nobel Prize for their discovery of radioactivity, um, and they became instantly enormously famous and popular in France, and they were hounded by the press. They were absolutely plagued by the press. They would come home at night, and people would be waiting to interview them. They would interview their daughter, who was four at the time. They wanted to interview the cat. News of radium set the world on fire. It was hailed a wonder drug. The Curies were swept up in the world's excitement of their discovery. Yeah, the Curies got into some wonderfully wacky antics. One time, Pierre Curie bound a sample of radioactive stuff to his arm. He kept it bound there for about 10 hours. When he removed it, he saw it had left a red burn mark, and he was inspired to keep a, a journal of the progress of this red burn mark. By the 10th day, he's noticing that the burn mark is way more angry, and by the 20th day, he's excitedly plotting the flows of pus and the formations, the exact formations of the mountains of pus crust. The excitement being here that obviously radioactive stuff destroys living tissue. So just possibly it might destroy cancer cells. Anyway, by the uh, 40th day, skin is kind of reforming. By the 52nd day, it's pretty much disappeared except for this little grey spot, which Pierre proudly declares to be the sign of a deeper injury. Little did Pierre and Mary know that their wonderment of radioactivity would be so short-lived. It's sometime after two o'clock in the afternoon, but it's not like today, it's raining. It's some kind of monsoon. Pierre's got his umbrella up, and Pierre Curie is approaching the Rue Dauphine. He's stepping out into the road, and at the same time, there's a large wagon, a horse-drawn wagon. The driver sees a tram coming up the Quai de Conti. He's stepping out actually behind a little horse and carriage, and at the same time now is coming down that heavy wagon. Pierre's knocked, he's holding on now to the horse, he's twisted round by the horse, and the driver steers this way so that the front two wheels completely miss the prone body of Pierre Curie, but the left rear wheel goes straight over his head. The shock was terrible, and uh, I would say Marie was never the same after. And the problem for her was to convince herself, uh, herself to continue living. And um, she wrote uh, something like, um, My Pierre, how many times did you say to me yourself that if you didn't have me, you might work, but you would be nothing more than a body without soul. And how will I find a soul when mine is left with you? <sighs> really, it was a terrific turning point is, uh, in Marie's life. After Pierre's death, Mary was kept going by her daughters, Eve and Irene. With difficulty, she pieced her life back together. But four years later, she was plunged into turmoil. She applied to be the first female member of the Academy of Sciences. The Institute, which had enormous power and influence in scientific life, refused to let her in. Then she became embroiled in a sexual scandal which shook France. She was accused of having a love affair with a fellow scientist, Paul Langevin, a married man and best friend of her late husband. They had a pied-à-terre near the Sorbonne, and for some reason they, they left their love letters there. The result of that was that um, Madame Langevin, Paul Langevin's wife, hired someone to break into the pied-à-terre and steal the love letters went to the press with them, and that became a, then the, the source of an enormous scandal in France about this love affair. The press loved it. They accused Madame Curie of wrecking Paul Langevin's marriage. 
In retaliation, Langevin challenged the paper's editor, Gustave Terry, to a duel. 11 a.m. November the 26th. It's apparently a foggy morning. Langevin has arrived first. He's described at picking and pulling at his moustache as he nervously walks up and down. And now here comes his combatant, Gustave Terry, the journalist. This battle is going to be held according to the laws of the duel, a handbook written in 1906 by Emily Bruno de Laborie. Pan Levy, Paul Pan Levy, is to conduct the combat. He gives his orders. Are you ready? One, two, three, fire. Langevin pulls his pistol out, points it directly at Terry. Terry pulls his pistol out, but points it directly at the ground. Langevin does not pull the trigger. He lowers his pistol to the ground, and the duel is over without a shot being fired. In the middle of this madness, the Nobel Committee awarded Mary another prize, but they told her not to collect it for fear of embarrassing them. This, I think, led to one of her most courageous moments because she wrote back saying, uh, I had believed that the Nobel Prize was being given for my work as a scientist and that my private life wasn't relevant, and I'm coming to accept the prize. And she went to Stockholm and accepted the prize. Irrespective of Marie Curie's personal life, her work dominated scientific thought. Radium was transforming science. And out of this discovery of, of radium, radioactivity then could be studied. And out of that, we have come to understand really the structure of matter, the structure of the atom. Scientists showed that there's a vast amount of energy locked inside the atom. Energy that could be harnessed as a fuel, kill cancerous cells, and obliterate whole cities. Marie lived to witness the implications of her work, and her life ended in a bittersweet way. She showed superhuman determination and courage to the very end, but was eventually overpowered by the very thing that she'd created. 32 years after Marie Curie discovered radium, it got the better of her. She died of what was then a mysterious blood disease, which was probably leukemia. Next week, Ken Campbell uncovers the science of genetics. That's at the same time 